what a day, a glorious day. What a beautiful song. Thank you for that. Welcome to each of you on this rather unusual time for a memorial service, but we're not calling it that. We're calling this a celebration of life. And so we want to welcome you this morning on a Friday morning, and we want to thank the uh, Grants Pass Church here for opening up their facilities. I know they had a little bit of an in because of the uh, pastor and his wife, but uh, we really appreciate your opening their service, uh, your, your uh, a church open for us for this uh, celebration. Now, if you knew my mom, she would not want this to be a memorial service. She would want this to be a celebration of life. It's interesting because when we would start talking about things that uh, maybe were a little bit on the negative side, she says, let's change the subject. <laughs> that was my mom. She uh, always wanted to do that. And you know, I, I'm so glad that many of you know her as this warm and loving uh, person. But I just want to let you know that she had a pretty wicked spoon uh, when it came for discipline. <laughs> and she used a wooden spoon. A wooden spoon is what I should say, yeah. And she knew how to use that, and I think that probably uh, kept us on the straight and narrow. So uh, we're uh, appreciative of it now. Not so much then, but now we are. So we want to welcome you to this celebration of life. And if you will uh, bow your heads, let's uh, have an opening prayer. Lord, we invite your presence now. This is your house, and we are here to worship you and to celebrate the life of my mom, Bonnie Delinsky. I think it's Bonnie Marie Delinsky. I just pray that you will help us remember how precious life is and that you will bring us closer to you during this time that we spend remembering and celebrating her life. Thank you. Amen. That was my uh, brother who was closest to me in age, although we are not very far apart at all. Each of us three kids are 15 months apart. So um, that was Kurt Delensky. Uh, he's he works for It Is Written, and um, that's who had our welcome and opening prayer. Thanks, Kurt. And uh, it's Bonnie May, even though she never, she hardly ever used it in our lifetime. She kind of dropped the May, kind of like when she got her new social security number or something. <laughs> um, I just want to share with you the um, precious life of a woman who is committed to the Lord and to service. Bonnie Mae Joyce Qualls was born in Santa Ana, California on April 17, 1932, which happened to be her mother's 40th birthday. She was the eighth of 10 children born to Jacob and Bernatina Qualls. Her mom, who went by Bertha, immigrated to the United States from Norway around age 20, shortly after becoming a Seventh-day Adventist. She met and married Jacob, Jake, Qualls, who was a laborer in a variety of arenas. He never became a Seventh-day Adventist, but Bertha was determined to rear her children in the church. Jake went along with it somewhat reluctantly at first, but Bonnie said after some years, he recognized the positive effect Adventist education was having on his children and became quite supportive of Bertha's choice. Bonnie was a happy child and her mom's nickname for her was Beamer. And I just found that out just in the three years that we've been living together here. Uh, because of her smiley, happy disposition, she told Karen one time that being the eighth child in a family that that large, you don't have the opportunity to ask a lot of questions. So you just quietly observe and listen closely to the hubbub, and you can usually find out what you need to know. Sometimes I would ask mom, mom, what did you, how is it with your mom for this? She says, I never asked those questions. There wasn't that kind of opportunity. Everything was too much of a hubbub working hard and, and lots of people. 
They moved up to Gaston, Oregon, close to Laurelwood Academy when Bonnie was young, so she and her siblings could attend the church school and academy. For a while, her father worked at a sawmill a few hours away, and on occasion, the family would go visit him versus him coming home. On one of those occasions, when she was quite young, Bonnie became enamored with watching the loggers walk across the massive logs floating on the water. Sometime later, she and her little sister, Julia, decided it would be fun for the two of them to walk on the logs. After all, loggers made it look so easy. So she and Julia stepped onto one of the logs, and as she was transferring to another log, it rolled and she fell in amongst the log jam. Julia had been holding her hand, and with no doubt the help of their guardian angels, she managed to keep a hold of her and helped her back up onto the log, and they quickly made it back to terra firma, having learned one of those life lessons. Bonnie was mostly cared for by her older sisters. When her father took up farming, she didn't care for the working in the fields, so her mom gave her permission to stay in the fields if if she would practice the piano and improve her talent, plus do cooking, laundry, and housework. That suited Bonnie quite well and much better, and music became an important part of her life. Her little brother Ben says, I remember that Bonnie was learning to play the piano when we were in grade school while I was learning to play the trumpet. When I played The Holy City, for special music at the Estacada Adventist Church, Bonnie accompanied me. She practiced for several weeks to learn that piano part. Bonnie's elementary education was completed at three different SDA schools as her parents moved around following work opportunities. Her first grade through the middle of third grade was at Laurelwood, then Silverton, where she completed third, fourth, and fifth grades, and finally finishing in Estacada, Oregon, graduating from the eighth grade in May of 1947. Bonnie began her high school education at Yakima Adventist Junior Academy in Yakima, Washington. I think it had a different name then, but living with her older sister, Blanche, and her husband, Blanche's husband, Dallas, Dal's Dull. And yes, Dal's Dull, my uncle, did pastor the boring Oregon church. Some people, when I've heard, have said they thought that was just a joke, but I said, no, that's true, that was my uncle. She had a classmate, Don Jacobson, who had an interest in her uh, academy, during her academy years, and we know this because many years later, on two separate occasions, when Marlon and Karen introduced themselves to him, he blurted out, you could have been my son, or you could have been my daughter. <laughs> Her sophomore year was spent at Walla Walla Academy in Washington, where she lived with another older sister, Helen, and her, hus and her husband, Phil Spechko. She completed her junior and senior years at Columbia Academy in Battleground, Washington. Apparently, her talents were readily appreciated as she became the junior class secretary that first year, as well as the associate editor for the yearbook and a prayer band leader. Her senior year was the editor in, in her senior year, she was the editor-in-chief for the yearbook. Her junior year, she roomed with Phyllis Dolinsky, a surname with a familiar ring. Bonnie's musical involvement during those two years included MV pianist, Sabbath school chorister, Lomco club chorister, ladies trio, ladies quartet, and senior sextet. She also worked in the business office doing what she listed in the yearbook as her ambition, secretarial work. Bonnie first met Rudy Delinsky at Gladstone, Oregon camp meeting between her junior and senior years. Their friendship grew during the following school year. The relationship, however, remained open and fluid as there were other possibilities to be explored. The attraction they had for each other and each other's qualities stood the test and they were married November 25, 1951, at the Martinsville Church in Portland, Oregon. Dal's Dole, Bonnie's brother-in-law, was the officiating minister. For the first couple years of their marriage, they lived in Salem, Oregon. Rudy worked for the state in the Department of Motor Vehicles, and Bonnie worked for the state as a key punch operator. 
Rudy then decided he wanted to pursue an electronics degree, so they moved to Los Angeles where he enrolled in the Western Electronics Institute while Bonnie worked as a receptionist for the Schlobohm Foam Rubber and Plastic Company. They lived very frugally in a tiny apartment cooking on a little hot plate. He graduated in 1954 and they moved to Oak Grove, California where Rudy opened his own business called Rudy's TV Repair Shop. Now that he had a degree in his own business, they were ready to start their family. On Halloween day, October 31, 1954, Marlon David Dolensky was born. 15 months later, January 17, 1956, in the exact same hospital room, Curtis Allen Dolensky came along so Marlon could have an opposite to contend with. Then, less Rudy and Bonnie got too comfortable with a family of four, Karen decided she better make an entrance, so passing both Bonnie and Rudy's April birthdays, she arrived on April 29, 1957, altering the family's gender ratio. Bearing three children inside of two and a half years, Bonnie was busily taking care of babies and remembers one day rocking one of the three as Rudy was going out the door to his shop in the morning and when he returned she was rocking yet another, telling Rudy, I've been here all day. She also helped with the business, however, many times having all three children at the shop. Sensing the direction television programming was headed, Rudy began feeling uneasy about rearing his family in that environment. He was convicted that it was not an industry that a Seventh-day Adventist Christian should be supporting. So, to the chagrin of his customers and friends, he simply closed the very successful business rather than selling it and started working for the government on sound and radio equipment. After one and a half years, they moved to Malala, Oregon, where they helped out at the turkey farm they jointly owned with Bonnie's folks. Rudy also drove school bus and started culporting part-time as well. It's hard to talk, to talk about mom without talking about dad. <laughs> Their lives were so intertwined. In the fall of 1959, Rudy decided he wanted to go full-time into the culportering work, so they moved to the Dalles, Oregon, where he became a full-time culporter for the Oregon Conference. Bonnie remembers praying in the morning that Rudy would get a sale that day so that they would have enough food to eat. After two years, the Holy Spirit started planting the thought of entering the ministry into both Bonnie and Rudy's minds without either of them mentioning it to the other until about two weeks later. The idea of Rudy going back to school to take theology was daunting with three small children which included moving across the country away from the family and everything familiar. So when Bonnie was agreeable to such a plan, Rudy was amazed and touched by her faith and bravery to take on such a challenge in the face of both of their families telling them that was entirely too risky and not a reasonable plan. But both were convicted of the call to ministry and chose to step out in faith, allowing the Lord to make a way. September 30, 1961, found them with all their belongings packed in a small cargo trailer hooked up to the axle of their VW Bug for their camping trip across the United States to Andrews University in Michigan, where Rudy resumed his undergraduate studies in theology this time. Rudy said it was all that VW Bug could do to maintain 25 miles an hour over the mountains with that trailer behind it. Uh, the little caveat, too, is we would stop, and uh, they had put the, the um, belongings in that trailer in such a way so that they could slide their mattress on the top of it, their double mattress. And so when nighttime came, if they could find a place, you had to find somewhere where you didn't have to pay, and they would pull over and open it up. Us three kids would sleep in the bug, and uh, they would lay on that mattress on the side of the road and get the sleep they needed in order to go on. And uh, one of those memorable times, too, was uh, we ran into a, this was in September, so we ran into a huge snowstorm in the Rockies, and um, they shut the freeway down. And 
Um, I, re I was only four, but I remember this, and I'm sure my brothers remember it. Uh, they shunted everybody into a little America, and when the, the dining room um, was finished serving dinner, they shoved all the tables to the outside edges and let all the travelers come in and just sleep on the floor of the dining room in Little America. I remember that very vividly. What? It was very exciting, yeah. They moved into student housing on the edge of campus so the whole family could walk to school and work. Tapping into his skills further developed in the Army during World War II, Rudy worked as a mechanic at the college gas station when he wasn't in classes. Bonnie got a secretarial job in Benton Harbor for a while until she landed the prestigious job of switchboard operator for the college in the center of the first floor of the ad building. Though there were babysitters employed, as the Didlensky children got older, the Andrews University campus became their playground. And whenever they needed to touch base with mom, they just, which probably was me most of the time, <laughs> they just uh, could walk to the ad building in the center of campus to her switchboard window in the main hallway and talk to her between incoming calls or see dad at the gas station if he wasn't in class or at the library studying. Karen remembers spending hours sitting with Bonnie at the switchboard, watching her plugging in all the extensions and yanking the plugs when the little indicator lights went out. Sometimes Bonnie would let her pull one out or plug one in. On one of Bonnie's trips to or from a Benton Harbor job in that same VW Bug that took them across the country, someone pulled out of a driveway in front of her and her evasion maneuvers landed her upside down in the ditch, totaling the bug. Being a poor college student family of five and Rudy being the skilled mechanic that he was, you can imagine the kinds of cars we ended up with after that. I remember one of them was $50. During those years, many an hour was spent on the side of the road with Rudy under the hood as Bonnie, who always demonstrated the patience of a saint, would calmly assure her brood that it wouldn't be much longer as they squirmed and whined. In 1965, Rudy graduated with a BA in theology. The Wisconsin Conference sponsored him as he went on into the Master of Divinity program. However, at the beginning of 1966, before his program was over, the conference offered him a position. After prayer and consideration, Rudy and Bonnie accepted the call to a five-church district. So at ages 39 and 33, Rudy and Bonnie had weathered the uphill faith climb of preparing for pastoral ministry. The family moved to a farmhouse surrounded with fields, pastures, and a creek to provide countless hours of wholesome play for their three children ages 12, 10, and 8. They were determined to rear their children in the fear of the Lord in spite of hearing, of bearing the spiritual leadership of five congregations, the Baraboo, Portage, Reedsburg, Oxford, and Adams Seventh-day Adventist churches. Shortly into their ministerial life, Bonnie started preparing their three children to be involved in ministry. On Friday nights, and sometimes Sabbaths, she gathered them around the piano and commenced to teach them to commit to memory multiple songs. They started out learning to sing in two-part harmony, then later discovered that they could sing in three-part harmony. I think some of that is because they played the King's Herald's Quartet so much in our home that we just, our ears got tuned. So as a result of Bonnie's diligent efforts during hours of patient practice with them, she fitted her children for ministry, at the same time managing, managing to make it enjoyable enough to elicit reasonably willing cooperation from them. From then on, Rudy and Bonnie included their children in ministering to the sick or elderly in homes or nursing facilities, as well as singing for church services and Rudy's evangelistic series. Marlon, Kurt, and Karen still remember to this day those songs Mom taught them. There's a new name written down in glory, back of the clouds, nothing between, Jacob's ladder, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. That's the song, that's the song that we broke into three-part harmony. Marlon, I don't know if you remember that. I, 
I said, I think I can sing a part, because Marlon was always the, the harmony. I, I could hear it, and so I started singing. Marlon said, well, I think I can do that other part. And boom, we had a trio just like instantly like that on that song, Heaven Came Down and Glory Filled My Soul. That's just to name a few of them. The Delinskys pastored in three districts of Wisconsin for a total of nine years before accepting a call in 1975 to Richmond, Virginia. Bonnie served as the church choir director and, as usual, the bulletin secretary, typing it up on a stencil, then running them off on an old mimeograph machine, now replaced by photocopiers. It was here that Rudy, in their basement, and Bonnie did the audio editing Sorry, I missed it. It was here that Rudy and Bonnie started being involved in audio media. They set up an audio editing studio in their basement, and Bonnie did the audio editing and duplicating of audio tapes of the Conference Evangelists series. This editing duplicating process consisted of splicing out all extraneous sounds or verbal mistakes on the audio recording reel-to-reel -reel tape followed by spinning the sermon onto cassette shells and assembling the cassette. So her secretarial skills uh, got expanded. This new arena to their ministry facilitated the 1981 invitation to head up the media center at the Potomac Conference in Stanton, Virginia, employing both of them. During these years in Virginia, Rudy officiated at the weddings of all three of their children. From the Potomac Conference, Rudy accepted a call to join the pastoral staff of the College Church on the campus of Southwestern University in Keene, Texas. Bonnie secured a job at the local bank in Keene. During this time, Rudy developed 24-hour radio programming that he set up to piggyback the 3ABN satellite, but which later evolved into the forming of the uplink for the Adventist-founded Life Talk Radio Network, which is now a ministry of the Adventist Media Center. In 1993, they retired and moved to Yakima, Washington to facilitate the development of the LifeTalk radio network. Bonnie served as receptionist secretary of the station and son-in-law Charles Bird was LTR's first live call-in talk show host on the LifeTalk radio network. In, 1980, uh, in 1996, Rudy attempted retirement again just to be called a few weeks later to Springdale, Arkansas to please come be the chief engineer of the developing safe TV station uh, by an Adventist there. They couldn't say no to the crying need, so moved to Arkansas. I remember they said to us, because we lived in Yakima there too, they said they pulled up a 16-foot rider truck and they said, we're gonna fill that truck and when it's full, we're driving away, and we're gonna let you take care of everything else. But there was remuneration from, like, Dad's shop smith and a few nice things. <laughs> so they filled it up, put the most important things in first, and when it was full, that's all they were taking. And away they went. They both worked at the station and endeared themselves to the congregation of the Springdale Adventist Fellowship where their intense involvement in the church was. In February of 2011, Rudy had a tragic vehicle accident which led to his passing on June 10 of the same year. Bonnie bravely pressed forward without her beloved life companion and latched onto her heavenly husband as she busied herself with the Springdale Church School in keeping with their lifelong passion for Adventist education. I remember her telling me it's her involvement in the school that helped her get out of bed every morning. She was the cook for the hot lunch program, taught music, developed a school choir, had a Christmas program, Christmas programs, and taught piano lessons at the school as well as privately in her home. In April of 2014, she had a bad car accident, which required four months in a rehab center to restore her legs and ankles that had been crushed. Three years later, when Charles and Karen accepted a pastoral call to Grants Pass, Oregon, Bonnie accepted their invitation to join them in moving back to what she considered her home state. 
On move-in day, she was passionately invited to join the Williams SDA Church and be their pianist as they had no pianist. Bonnie, in keeping with her lifelong habit of choosing to serve the Lord, accepted their invitation and for the past three plus years took on not only the pianist position, but was constantly praying and seeking to support and inspire outreach in Williams in spite of her failing health. No matter how she felt, she would dream about what they could do there in Williams to, to um, bring souls into the Lord. It was, <clears throat> it was in about 2005 or six when Karen insisted Bonnie see a pulmonolog uh, pulmonologist for her frequent coughing that she was diagnosed with. And she was diagnosed with permanent lung damage from long-term untreated asthma. No one, not even she, knew about this silent disease that crept up on her as she almost unconsciously adjusted her activity to it. It was this condition that developed into severe asthma, emphysema, and eventual respiratory failure on October 23, 2020. Today, we celebrate Bonnie's life a life of service to her Lord, both in and outside her home, never retiring from it. We, her children, experienced and observed a praying mother who united in ministry with dad, who never gave in to despondency or discouragement. No, not even at his passing, though she missed him terribly. A woman dedicated to her creator to the end. Um, if my brothers would come up here now, um, we thought we would just share with you one of the songs that mom taught us. Um, of course, our voices have changed significantly since then, but uh, we figure you're a forgiving audience. So we're going to share with you nothing between. Now, oftentimes we would sing a cappella, but uh, we opt for the support of the piano. And this is Colleen, who is playing, who is Kurt's um, wife, Colleen Mudelinski. Uh, I'm not sure we can do anything after that live sketch. <laughs> sketch of our mother.
That's where little brother Ben. She loved Tom Scrabble. She's sitting by her sister-in-law, my dad's sister. We went on a cruise together with my dad's sister and us. All her grandchildren, almost all. This is their 50th anniversary right here. Marlon and Kurt. The whole family. The whole family again. She also was a cook for the Potomac Conference for their events, so they awarded her an apron. This, I believe, are her grandparents, and these are her parents, Bertha and Jake. This is Bonnie with her brother Frank, I believe. All her family. I think she was 15 in this picture. There are her siblings. Yakima Junior Academy. This is at their honeymoon at Cannon Beach. Mom is the new child. All three of us. Three of us again. I think that's a camp meeting. Visiting Grandma and Grandpa. That picture was taken at Andrews. That's my dad's graduation. They were starting to be teenagers. Awkward, lanky looking teenagers. their house in Texas. This is missing one grandchild there. I think that's a picture of me, Karen. That's all three of us with mom. Mom and Sharon's wedding. This is Kurt's Academy graduation, yeah, Wisconsin Academy. Marlon's dorm room in college. So, Charles and my wedding. It's her wedding picture. Such a happy couple. Kurt and Colleen's wedding. Classmates at a reunion in Columbia Academy. Danae's wedding. The 
didn't hide from Nancy. And did I mention she loved Scrabble? <laughs> it's my graduation. It's like Amy's graduation. I'm working with Safe TV and had a booth. This is her academy roommate at the reunion. Amy's graduation. Don't you love that picture of her? Is in the it is written event is that other picture. Grandchildren. GC session in Utrecht. All that there were hardly any of her by herself. And that's because Bonnie's life was always about others. And uh, I always was impressed when I saw how many people would come to me and say, I just love your mother-in-law. She's just such a wonderful person. And I'm like, you don't even know her. How did you come up to that conclusion? But I think others saw that, that she was always serving. And it impressed them. And so... I, don't, I can't tell you how many times people would come to tell me how much they loved Bonnie. And because of that, there may be someone here just now who would like to share a little bit. And maybe, maybe Kurt or Marlon could carry mics around. If anyone would like to say a word or two, uh, this is your opportunity to say a word or two. And, uh, and so just raise your hand and they'll bring you a, a mic. If anyone has someone, something that they would like to say, uh, this is your opportunity to do that. <laughs> well, the mic just got handed to me. <laughs> um, what, I, what do I remember of Green? So, um, my husband Jared and I would travel up to Arkansas. She was the one that convinced me I was in a bad relationship before Jared. And we were at Christmas and she told me, um, Danae, you need to go to Southwestern Adventist University. You need to, you need to leave this place um, where I was at at the time. And she says, I'll drive you. You know, that whole throw everything in the car and go, that was a real thing. She's like, we've got enough room. We'll take you back and we'll drop you off in Texas on our way to Arkansas. I said no, but it was a seed that had been planted. And through the prayers of, of everyone, I was able to leave the, the poor relationship that I was in 
And um, I took her up on that, and I think because of that, we developed a very special connection. And she was the close, her and Grandpa were the closest um, family that lived to Texas, so Jared and I would go up there all the time, and they accepted him right away with his long hair and everything, didn't ask any questions. <laughs> and that was really impressive to him. And so we made, a, we made trips up there like three or four times a year when I was in college. And those were, those were times outside of our big family gatherings where I got to know them personally. Just an example, Grandpa would sneak us off to ice cream. And Grandma, he'd be like, let's not tell Grandma about this. <coughs> so I learned that you know he was the more indulgent one. Didn't know that <laughs> when we were all together. but. Yeah, I will miss those trips. Now, you mentioned Jared beside you, your husband now. You said, except in his long hair. I've never seen your hair that short. <laughs> so Jer Jared, almost all the time I've known him, he's had this long hair. And, and in a number of Jesus skits, he would be a Jesus, so Jesus, you know, for these uh, Easter things. So anyway, it's good to see his short hair and all. Had to do a double take. Yes, <laughs> yes. I just want to share um, one of the members in, in Springdale, Arkansas, who made a, a big impact on um, my, my parents made a big impact on her. She wanted to, she sent in her memoir. She said, I met Bonnie and Rudy Delinsky around 2005 at the Springdale Seventh-day Adventist Church. Bonnie and Rudy were, were fire doing God's work, were on fire doing God's work in so many different ways. Both of them made a huge impact in my life, as well as my three girls. Quickly, Bonnie made a place in my heart. She truly cared about all people. She was kind, direct, and always told me exactly what I needed to hear somehow. A woman of virtue, a true woman of God. All of the memories I hold in my heart are far too many to write on this piece of paper. It would be more like a book. But through it all, I can say that I would not be who I am today if she had not been in my life. She taught me so much, maybe even more than she knew. Just by being around her, hearing her ideas, and seeing her actions, I am not sure if Bonnie ever knew this, but I could never tell her no. <laughs> she could have asked me anything, and I would have done it. I looked at her more like a family member than a friend. My heart hurts knowing I will not see her again on this earth, but I find peace in knowing I will see her again when Jesus returns soon, and for that day I cannot wait. That was Michelle Hernandez. Mm. Anyone else would like to speak? Just raise your hand and Kurt will bring you a mic. So go ahead, Gloria. Uh, <clears throat> I haven't known Bonnie for very long, but I was I decided to go out to the Williams Church when all this COVID thing started because I I heard that they didn't wear masks and they were all from the older generation and I thought I qualify. And so, <laughs> so I thought that it was my idea <clears throat> to go out to Williams Church, but God had a plan and I wasn't going to tell anybody that I played the piano, but it somehow came out. And so Bonnie says, will you play? And so I thought, just one Sabbath. I thought, OK, I'll do that. Well, no, it wasn't just one Sabbath. It was to take over. And <coughs> so anyway, she would be an encouragement because I always would flub up, always. Every time I would mess up some, I mean, I didn't totally destroy the song, but Anyway, she would say, oh, you're doing fine, you're doing fine. So anyway, um, then when she died, I, I knew why I was at that church. Mm. She knew she was failing, <clears throat> and I know she was praying for, for the Williams Church to have a pianist. Bonnie and I used to sit down and talk together when she moved here when there were going to be meetings, and we got to know each other, and... I told her that I had a daughter out in Williams, that I didn't even know where she was. And she was determined that she was going to find her, and she was going to minister to her, and she did. She found her one day, I can't remember, Karen come running up to me in church one day and says, I have to tell you something, I have to tell you something. And she told me that Bonnie had found Julie. 
and that she actually went up and had Bible studies with her. They had to take a four-wheel drive up this mountain to find her. And they did Bible studies with her sometimes. And Bonnie took Julie home and fed her. And just when I told Julie that Bonnie had died, it broke her heart. She says, the first thing that I'm going to do when I get to heaven is look for Bonnie and her husband. Mm. And I know she touched her life in a way that nobody else ever has. She saw a genuine, loving Christian that loved her unconditionally. And I will forever be grateful to her because if my daughter's in heaven, it's because of Bonnie. Mm. Thank you. Nice. <clears throat> Julie? Yes, I knew Bonnie for a little bit toward the end there, and I was really encouraged by her um, <clears throat> in different ways. She had different people she was giving Bible studies to. She had Julie, and then she had um, another young man, Michael, I think his name was. And um, that was really neat to see. I loved playing Scrabble with her. She was a very worthy opponent. And... Um, she was encouraging in that she had problems breathing, but she still got out there every day and walked and did her steps, and she climbed up her steps to her apartment, and she just was determined to, you know, keep up her health in that way. She, um, um, she was particular about what she ate, <laughs> and I was able to cook for her once, and I... Um, I guess I didn't know about her being particular at that time, so I put it in front of her and I said, and she kind of looked at it and I said, now don't turn your nose up at it <laughs> before you try it. <laughs> and so she tried it. <laughs> she didn't change her mind, but she did try it. So <laughs> I enjoyed Bonnie. She was a lot of fun for me. And she had good advice as well. Very insightful lady. You know, you mentioned uh, playing Scrabble. Uh, that's all I can remember from her. The crazy thing is, I don't ever remember her winning. <laughs> she would Always play, 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 and, and she would never, she never win. It's just so interesting. That wasn't what mattered. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was just for the fun of it. Well, she beat me when I was small. Oh, <laughs> I see. Yeah. Huh. Right over here. While well, the you? microphone is getting over to Carrie. I just want to share a few things uh, that mom did that made a deep impression on me. I remember as a little kid sitting in church at Andrews University. And of course, they were very poor. Um, we didn't really know it, but they were, because <laughs> they were trying to get through school without being in debt. And um, so all, you know, usually change would be put in the offering plate. But one day, the offering plate came by and she put in a dollar. And I remember as a kid looking at her and my mouth just dropped open and I said, a dollar, you know? I was just like, that was huge. And she quietly turned to me, she said, if I can spend a dollar on ice cream, I can give Jesus a dollar. And I was just like, whoa. I never forgot that. Um, some of her sayings were, Live and let live. Remember, Marlon Kurt? Live and let live. And some of her other sayings was that she would uh, repeat throughout life is, we eat to live, we do not live to eat. It's, you know, eating for strength and not for gluttony. But that's how she would put it. We eat, for, we eat to live, not live to eat. Um, she just had these little one-liners that were uh, made an impression. Yes, Carrie. It's funny that you were uh, talking about Bonnie sitting back and kind of watching things, just being observant. And I saw that in her that I, I would be like, she's so quiet. She's just kind of sitting there watching things, but she was so observant. And, um, you know, when I think of Bonnie, Bonnie was firm but kind, diplomatic, and honest. And I remember um, 
I had the opportunity to play Scrabble with her sometimes too, and and uh, I don't recall her ever winning. <laughs> but um, I remember one time I asked Bonnie about a situation, and I said, uh, and I had opportunity to spend some time with her, and I said, do you think I handled that situation okay? And she said, she sat back and she thought for a moment and she said, well, I think both of you could have handled it a little bit differently. <laughs> and that's just kind of the way she was. She was just so diplomatic in the way she handled things. And, but there was also a side to Bonnie that she was kind of funny sometimes too. And she would make you laugh. And I just, I'm gonna miss her a lot. I loved her very much. And I don't like a lot of old people, but. <laughs> but I'm old now, so. <laughs> but I loved her. <clears throat> well, it looks like uh, we got another here. I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't know the Delinskys that well. But I do remember when we were living back in Wisconsin that I remember Rudy was involved with sound systems in the churches back there in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And um, then I got reacquainted with Bonnie when she moved out here with the birds a few years ago, uh, just shortly after we came out here. and. Um, we got to play Scrabble together, too, a few times. And uh, thanks to Karen, she tipped me off. She says, uh, you know, Mom likes to play Scrabble. Maybe you could get together with her. And I said, sure, be glad to. And um, she was great at Scrabble. She would always win. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have won one game when we played together. And she and I were involved with uh, the widows and single ladies get together once a month at different restaurants here around town. And, and she went with us, I think, a couple of times. And I just loved Bonnie. She was such a sweet lady. I miss her already, and uh, we'll continue to miss her, missing her. But um, we'll pick up that friendship in heaven and continue for all eternity. Amen. And we're looking forward to that. Amen. Colleen. Well, um, maybe I'll do this just for this. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the one thing that's already been stated that I've always felt about Mom Delinsky is uh, the unconditional love that she has and the acceptance. That's something that's reflected in her children as well, which is one reason I love being married to Kurt. Uh, there's just this arms wide open attitude for everybody as well as the ministry, but um, uh, uh, two quick things. The one thing I'm remembering might seem trite, but back when they lived in Texas one Christmas, she gave me a gift that just kind of got to the bottom of my heart. She doesn't really like cats, but I love cats. And she knew this, and so she found this beautiful stuffed Himalayan cat. Not only did she get that for me for Christmas, she got me this beautiful blue basket with a blanket in there and balls of yarn. And, you know, it's just the perfect, I almost cried. I don't know why that touched me so much, but she knows how to reach out in a way you can understand. I also uh, got a text from Ryan. Our son, Ryan, couldn't be here today. He's a physical therapist, and uh, he's had some exposure, although he's not sick, so he didn't feel he could come. He and Christy wanted me to share this. Uh, they remember having a morning devotional with Grandma Bonnie during a Christmas get-together. And uh, they remember her sharing her faith with them in a special way, and, and uh, she passionately shared with them how she can't wait for heaven to see Rudy again. Mm. And uh, we know that's been shared earlier as well, how much she loved him and misses him. Uh, he says, she was a genuine and encouraging grandmother, and it was a blessing to spend time with her, the time that they had. And he's sorry he can't be here today. As, uh, as Philip and uh, Matthew come up here, um, and since Matthew has a mic in his hand, 
I will say that Matthew had the privilege of living with Bonnie for a, a short time there in Arkansas. But before that, uh, we were actually living uh, in, in um, uh, their barn because our house wasn't ready. And so we pushed our camper into their garage and we lived there for a little bit. And uh, just to let you know that Bonnie, Bonnie uh, did have opinions about things, but she tr generally tried to be diplomatic. But she, she had an experience with Matthew that I think is worth repeating. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't sure if I was going to share that or not, but seeing how you brought it up, uh, going with going with your wooden spoon thing there, she uh, I was thirteen, fourteen, and uh, being a teenager and a brat, she, uh, I, f I forget exactly what I was doing, but I was in the laundry room, and I think I was banging on the lid of the washer making noise and she looked at me and she said Matthew stop that and she was in the kitchen and I don't know what got into me but I just picked it up and I looked right at her and I banged it again and that's she, my son <laughs> and she didn't say a word she just dried her hands on her towel and walked into the laundry room and just hauled off and whacked me across the face <laughs> open hand right across the cheek we don't know her ever doing that to anybody. <laughs> she, she said nothing, but she said everything. <laughs> she did that, and she turned, and she walked back, and she never brought it up again. And I felt about this big, and, uh, and just uh, at the reunion in June, we were talking about it, and I told her about it, and she had no recollection of it. And as soon as we were talking about it, I, I was sharing how that she had made that impression upon me. Um, of not needing to say anything. Her life was um, enough. So getting that from her, uh, that discipline from her, and sharing it with her, she heard it for about five minutes, and she said, well, let's just stop talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't want to talk about it anymore. That's what she would always do. And when we were talking about something she didn't like, yes, Amy, Amy's going to say one word, and then... Uh, huh? And then Karen will say a word, and then we'll sing. Well, it's more than one word. All right. She gets three words. <laughs> I'm feeling well, generous. Um, Go ahead. I remember the, the night that uh, Grandma died, I got a text from Mom. That's how I found out. And I remember I was just kind of silent, and I just sat there. And I was kind of flooded with a bunch of the memories, because, you know, we, didn't, we never lived by her, but we'd have great get-togethers. And I just kind of, they all just kept coming. And then... I started laughing out loud, and Kale um, was right next to me. He said, well, what just happened? And I actually said, well, it's, I just found out that Grandma Bonnie died, but I just remembered something really great about her. Um, there, um, in 2008, I think it would be, we went down to visit them in Springdale, because that was the closest driving distance we'd be able to go um, see them. And we went bowling with their church group. And I, how old would Grandma have been in 2008? I'm not sure, but... Born in 32. But uh, she bowled with us. And she got a higher score than Kale. <laughs> and I remember him trying to think of reasons to give excuses for that. And I just... That just made me laugh. And just to think, you know, nothing stops Grandma. She would just... She'd just do something if there was something to do, and she could do it. And watching her bowl, I remember being afraid she was going to fall over or something. But nope, she just hauled it on down there and knocked over a bunch of pins. <laughs> and uh, there was one other, I was debating whether to share this, but we were in our house in Colton, and there was, of course, a Scrabble game going. And Dad called me into the kitchen, and he's like, look at the word Grandma played. <laughs> And it was a certain four-letter word that I won't say because we're in church. But she, he said, look, you've got a wild and crazy grandma. <laughs> and I would think about that pretty much every time we played Scrabble. <laughs> so I just couldn't not say any of those things. Because, yeah, it warms my heart. Mm. Our son, Luke, uh, who is between, um, he's our middle son. We have Philip, our youngest, and Matthew, our oldest. But um, 
they had COVID kind of course through their family, so uh, with all the yeah, exposure and so forth, they uh, weren't able to come. But he wanted me to share this. He says, I remember from a young age, always looking forward to grandma's potato curry when we were going to visit, usually for the holidays. I may not have ever played Scrabble if it weren't for her and enjoy my memories of playing with her. I am so thankful that in spite of not having spent a lot of time with her over her life, I have a wonderful last memory with her in Tahoe when I got to carry her up the stairs into the room when she was too winded. Just getting to hold her in my arms will always be a precious memory. And, and, so and now you're going to try to sing. And now we're going to sing. Oh, no. <laughs> I, can, uh, I can give you a moment. It's interesting, the funny, the, th the memories that stick with you that, that mean something. She taught me how to hold a pencil correctly. <laughs> I was doing my homework at her house, and I, it was uncomfortable for me to hold a pencil the way a normal hand would hold a pencil. So I would use my middle finger. And she saw me doing that. She saw me doing. She saw me doing that. She said, "We're going to teach you how to do it right." And I didn't want to, <laughs> but I do now. <laughs> so anytime I hold a pen or a pencil for a long time, and see that dent in my finger. I remember the dent she showed me in her finger from all her secretarial, mm -hmm. secretarial work.
I have the privilege of being able to bring up with me Mom's Bible. Her favorite one, The Clear Word, and as you can see, it's well marked. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. This is Mom's Bible. I'm happy to bring it up here to begin uh, sharing a few thoughts with you. In Proverbs 3, 15 to 18, Solomon talked about a good woman. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. This passage describes many moms represented here gathered today, as well as those viewing via online streaming the celebration of a life well lived. Well, that passage from Proverbs describes our mom to a T. She was a tree of life to our dad. And his abrupt switch from a career in electronics to pastoral ministry, and to us, her three children. We held her fast, especially my sister and brother-in-law, since she came to live with them for the last few years of her life. And we have been blessed, just as Solomon said we would. She taught us eternal values and the way we should go while very young. And while we chafed a bit, under her tutelage growing up, now in our own mature years, none of us have departed from it. Mom took Solomon seriously, especially when he wrote about training up a child in the way he should go. I think our mom was a good example of the truth of those words. They have stood the test of time. Right down to the moment, these thoughts became the homily I'm now sharing with you. When a parent dies, especially the last parent, we lose our beginnings and our security. The world is a different place without our parents. But mom prepared us well for moving into this stage of life. And we now carry on in our own lives fundamental values she so diligently planted in us. Things like every human soul has intrinsic value no matter how down and out they are. It seemed we always had somebody living with us <clears throat> that was having a hard time in life and she was trying to bring them up, make their life better because of the Christian principles that she was living out and having us participate with her. She also made sure that we understood that church attendance is not to be taken lightly. And oh yes, every church needs a choir. And that choir, somewhere along the way, should always sing one of her favorites and my dad's when the role is called up yonder. I'm especially thankful for the gift of my mother's last years here in Oregon with my sister and your pastor. I'm thankful that Charles had the foresight to urge us to come for a visit in September and not wait for the planned Thanksgiving get-together. Despite the heavy smoke from the nearby fires choking us and giving us an additional reason to wear a mask, we were together as an extended family doing the things that we knew mom would most enjoy. And of course, that included many rounds of Scrabble. As believers in the efficacy of Christ's sacrifice and resurrection, we're only looking at a beginning here. And what a future we have to look forward to. This corruptible will put on incorruption. 
Whatever type of body we will have in heaven, nobody knows except that it'll be much better than what we have here now. Paul, writing to the believers in Philippi, said, the Lord Jesus Christ will transfigure these wretched bodies of ours into copies of his glorious body. Philippians 3.21. We as a family like to walk and hike a lot. We've lived in a lot of places, lots of places to walk and lots of places to hike. And they were particularly enjoyable and almost looked forward to as Sabbath afternoon events. And I know Kurt wouldn't mind if every Sabbath involved some form of hiking or biking. Karen and Charlie can attest that that has continued since moving to Williams. Mom set a goal every day to walk. When she first moved to this location, there were plenty of wooded roads and paths to walk all kinds of trees. In her last couple of years, those walks have gotten trimmed a bit. Or as I like to think of it, mom took up track and field. She was walking the roundabout driveway of Karen and Charlie every day. And every time I would come to visit, we would talk as she did her laps. In my mind, the next walk her five foot, five inch frame will take, if she chooses not to fly, will be on translucent streets of gold. Smiling up at my six foot, three and a half inch dad, the both of them carrying on with their heavenly father, surrounded by fellow children of God that she and dad have touched over the years of their ministry together. Those from Baraboo, Oxford, Portage, Reedsburg, Adams Friendship, Green Bay, Sturgeon Bay, Fish Creek, Milwaukee, Richmond, Stanton, Keene, Yakima, Springdale, Arkansas. Yes, we moved a lot. And most recently, including those of you that knew her and worshiped with her at the Williams Church, the last church she was a member of. So today, we set aside this time to thank God that our mom, Bonnie Mae Joyce Qualls Delinsky, got the chance to walk this earth as his adopted daughter for 88 jam-packed years and who now sleeps awaiting the resurrection morning. Or as a song lyric from the Happy Songs book that she enjoyed playing from and teaching us from on Sabbaths in our early years says, the golden morning is fast approaching. Jesus soon will come to take his faithful and happy children to their promised home. And I can hear her teaching me the melody of that chorus. Oh, we see the beams of the golden morning piercing through this night of gloom. Oh, we see the gleams of the golden morning that will burst the tomb. Stand together and sing when the roll is called up yonder, one of her favorites.
with you in that earth made new, in that heaven at last where the immortal can sing praises to your name. Thank you for the privilege of knowing Bonnie as mom, as son-in-law, as friend, as neighbor, as spouse. Thank you for the privilege of knowing Bonnie as a daughter of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Thank you for her example. Thank you for her intentionality of following you. And thank you for that example to each of us to follow closely in your footsteps, just as she did. Lord, in these last few years, she, she read through her Bible. She was so looking forward to reading Revelation, the last book. And Lord, I pray that as she comes up in that resurrection morning, that she will have all of her sons and their spouses, her daughter, Karen's spouse, all the grandchildren, all the great-grandchildren, that she will have everyone together and there will be no tear in her eye, no disappointment. Because we've chosen to follow the same God she chose. May that day come quickly, we pray. And may we, like Bonnie, so live our lives that others will want to be your children too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'd like to thank each of you for taking the time to spend this time with the family. What a privilege. Uh, if you'd like to spend a little time at the table out there or talking to the family, feel free to do so. And uh, you all have a wonderful preparation day. Bonnie fell asleep as Friday ended and the new Sabbath drew on. She's now resting. I pray that this Sabbath you'll have a true Sabbath day's rest as well. Thank you. God bless.